Good morning, church. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open them up to Genesis chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 18 through 29. As you're turning there, let me make a brief announcement to you. Many of you have asked what we're doing and continuing to do in the um, realm of replanting churches. One of our initiatives in our Rise campaign is we want to send long-term missionaries, but we also want to send people um, locally to restore declining and struggling congregations. There are uh, many of them that need that kind of help, and TJC is, wants to answer that call to help churches like that. And so this September, September 15th and 16th, we're actually putting on a conference here with the North American Mission Board. Um, that's a Friday and a Saturday morning, Friday night, Saturday morning. And we're going to be talking about replanting, what it means to replant, why we're replanting. And so this is for everyone. Um, this is not only to educate our church, but we're also inviting churches from the community to try to kind of break up that soil and get the conversation started. So put that on your calendar. Registration will open uh, soon, September 15th and 16th. All right, go ahead and stand with me. Genesis chapter 9, verse 18 through the end of the chapter. In this passage, we're going to conclude Noah's story. This is the end of Noah's story, and it ends somewhat poorly. But I think it's going to be an encouragement to you because God tends to work through broken people. That's the kind of people God chooses and God works through. Genesis 9, 18. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. These are the words of our Lord. And be seated. Let's go ahead and pray together. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you for the words that we just heard about our forgiveness in Christ and that moment we had together at the Lord's table. Father, we want to pray now as we go to your word that you would open our eyes and open our hearts that we may behold wondrous things from your law, as the psalmist says. Give us eyes and ears to hear, and God, I pray that by your spirit you would speak to each individual hear the message that you intend. Help me to be faithful to your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Romans 15, Paul told the church that whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. He's talking about the Old Testament. Paul says that the Old Testament was written, at least in part, for the encouragement, the hope, the instruction of the church. The Old Testament is for the church. And we're meant to learn from it. We're meant to be encouraged by it. It's meant to give us hope. And that reminds me of a man that uh, I once discipled named Roger. Um, when I met Roger, he was living on the streets and he was using every dollar he could find for alcohol. And the only reason he came to us is because no one else would take him. And we ended up getting him into our recovery home and he started to come to church, hearing the gospel. He got sober and he got saved, became a Christian. And then Roger started reading the Bible. And I remember one day he came to me and he said, Brandon, I never read the Bible before. I thought it would be a bunch of holy people in white robes that were sinless. And what I found is that these people are really messed up. And I said, yeah, they're just like you and me. What do you think about that? He goes, it gives me hope. It gives me hope. The Bible is not afraid to be honest about even its most prominent characters. Abraham lied Jacob deceived his father, Moses was a murderer, Rahab was a prostitute, Samson was a womanizer. 
David was an adulterer and a murderer. Jonah ran from God. Joseph, who was presumed to be Jesus' father, doubted the angels and God's word. Martha worried about everything. Peter denied the Lord three times. Paul was once a persecutor of the church. And here we see Noah gets drunk and exposes himself. I was this close to entitling this message, when Christians get drunk and show their rear ends. (laughs) But we didn't want to submit that formally. God has shown a pattern of using broken and sinful people to accomplish his redemptive purposes. That seems to be the people God uses. And, and skeptics, critics, love to look at stories like Noah and they love to, to criticize Christianity with, with comments like, how could your God use a man that did things like this? Not knowing that they're looking directly into a mirror. Nevertheless, I mean, it, it's, it's encouraging because this story proves Paul's words true that the scriptures, the Old Testament, are for our encouragement. I mean, to me, this story is encouraging. It gives me instruction. It gives me hope. And that's the design of this passage for us. It's meant to teach us. And so, Christians, one thing you can take away, we're going to talk about a lot today, but one thing you can take away and find that encouragement in is God uses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect plans. God uses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect plans. He not only delights to redeem sinners, He loves to use sinners for his purposes, even you, even me. And that's what Noah's story shows us. So as we approach this final episode in Noah's life, the floodwaters have cleared. Noah and his family have now exited the ark. And the first thing Noah did was worship the Lord. In response, God gives blessings and he gives promises to Noah and his family. He told them like Adam before him to be fruitful and to multiply, fill the earth. Like the first man, he said, take dominion over the animals. They then instituted laws and government, and God made a covenant with Noah, promising never to flood the earth again. In many ways, Noah is the new Adam. He's God's appointed ruler. He enters into a brand new world. He's given a covenant with promises. But like Adam, Noah is a failure. He is a sinner. The flood might have washed away everything in the world, but it did not wash away their sins. And so as we get into this passage, you're going to see many things. Well, let's begin. I'm going to give you just kind of five stopping points as we go through the text. We'll begin first looking at Noah's sons. Noah's sons. Look at verse 18. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, Japheth, and Japheth, Ham was the father of Canaan. So eight people entered the ark, four couples, and eight people got off. Noah, his sons, and all their wives. These are Noah's sons. So Shem, though he's the middle child, he's mentioned first, and that's probably because from Shem came the line of Abraham, and from Abraham came the Christ. So Shem is prominent. Japheth, he is mentioned last, even though he's the oldest, and scholars have traced his lineage to Europe and Asia. And then there's Ham the youngest. And right from the beginning, Ham is identified as the father of Canaan. And that's significant, especially for Moses' first readers, the Israelites who just came out of Egypt and are now getting ready to go into the promised land. They would have read the book of Genesis or at least heard it read. And they would have seen in this passage, Ham was the father of Canaan. And the reason that's important is because Canaan produced the Canaanites. And we'll talk more about this in a moment, but the Canaanites were the inhabitants of the land before Israel took over. The Canaanites were those wicked people that Israel drove out. And before it was called Israel, it was the land of Canaan. So these are the sons of Noah. And from these sons, the whole earth is populated. Look at verse 19. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth The whole of the earth was dispersed, or the word dispersed could mean populated. So in a sense, every man and woman alive today is a descendant of Noah, and every man and woman alive today, if it was possible, could trace their lineage back to one of Noah's three sons. And so this is more than 
just sharing some information. This is actually a preview to the next chapter, chapter 10. You know, we're not going to read it, but if you look at chapter 10, it's often referred to as the table of nations. And it shows you basically the three sons and their lineage and how their lineage filled the earth. And so this sets us up for a much bigger story than just Noah getting drunk and showing himself. It demonstrates the providence and the sovereignty of God over all the earth. First of all, God is setting up the world to fulfill, once again, his command to be fruitful and multiply, to cultivate the world. But it's also showing you the sovereignty of God over every single man, woman, and child ever born. In Acts 17, 26, listen to what Paul said to the Greek philosophers. He said, the Lord made from one man, to that he's referring to Adam, but you could even see that in Noah, made from one man... Every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. So Noah's story shows us God setting up the history of the world, and it points to the fact that where you were born in this world and when you were born in history was determined by God. It's not an accident that you were born in the 20th or 21st century in the United States of America. God not only chose you uh, for salvation, he chose you to be born in the precise location you were born in. This is also a good point for us to say that every single human being has descended from one man, which means that there is only one race, and that's the human race. Which goes to say, logically, that racism or any kind of prejudice based on skin color, ethnicity, nationality, is not only condemned by Scripture, it's unreasonable and really it's just illogical because we are all descendants of one man. We may look and behave differently, we may come from different places, but we all come from Adam, we all come from Noah. It's sad to say that this text, you may not realize, has been used to justify racism throughout church history. Uh, I won't get into great detail, but Canaan's curse has been used to justify Um, slavery against dark-skinned people because Canaan's descendants were dark-skinned. Even into the mid-20th century, this was the position of the uh, Mormon church until they had a revelation that said that they needed to change that. It was a very convenient time, too, when they did that. These are the sons of Noah. All right, moving on then. Let's look at Noah's sin. Noah's sin. This is where we really start to get into interesting parts of this story. Verse 20. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. So Adam was commanded to cultivate the earth, subdue it. And Noah is continuing that practice by cultivating the natural resources of the planet. And you can see here he builds a vineyard. He's he's growing grapes. He's going to turn those grapes into wine. So he has he has drink and he has food. This, this goes back to chapter 4. Man has shown great capabilities. Man has shown that he can develop music and cities and infrastructure. Man is a worker of metal. He's a worker of the ground. This is the cultural mandate. And Noah is continuing this by becoming a farmer. And I know these episodes, these, these stories seem to kind of run like, oh, they got off the boat, they worshipped, and he built a vineyard and got drunk. But this probably would have taken a long time. I mean, this is at least two years after Noah and his family got off the boat. How do we know that? Because that's about the minimum time it takes to grow a vineyard. It could also be considerably longer if, if Noah gets up and immediately curses Ham's son after his drunken night, then Canaan's the fourth son of Ham, which means it would have been several years down the road after they got off the ark. I say that because it's easy to read the Bible as if these events just happen one right after another, but there's often big time gaps in these events. Well, at some point, Noah's vineyard comes to fruition and he makes those grapes into wine. Look at verse 21. He drank of the wine and became drunk and laid uncovered in his tent. The other night I was um, not doing this, but <laughs> I was talking to my family been a long time, church, a long time. Um, I was talking to my family about this story, and I was just kind of, you know, paraphrasing it to my daughter, and she goes, I told her, you know, Noah got drunk and, you know, laid in his, his tent naked and was shamed, and my daughter, seven years old, she said, Noah did that? Like, she was shocked that righteous Noah could, could fall from grace, 
And I loved her response and it caught my attention because that's how the first readers of the Bible would have responded. And if you think back to when you first read the Bible, if you were one of those people that read the Bible for yourself as you're reading this story, this is a moment where you're like, wow, I didn't see that coming. Noah's, he, I mean, in a sense, he was the savior of the world. He was the, he was the righteous one that you know, God put his blessing on and he's supposed to be the one setting forth this godly example. Then all of a sudden we get to this story and he's drunk and he's naked. And here's what the Bible's trying to tell you. Noah's not perfect. In fact, it's showing you Noah is not the savior. He's not the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. That was promised in Genesis 3. There's still another one coming, the Bible says. In fact, that's, that's why you see Moses falls the way that he does. That's why Moses doesn't enter into the promised land. The Bible's saying there's still another prophet coming. That's why David falls into sin with Bathsheba and killing her husband there's still another king coming and when he finally does come he's the sinless one who then gives himself up for sinners what an incredible story the bible is now it wasn't a sin for Noah to drink wine it was a sin for Noah to get drunk that's that's how the text is presenting it that's why it's so brief when it says Noah drank wine and became drunk it's showing disapproval and I just want to talk just a moment, a little bit, about alcohol. This is where Christians fall into one of two ditches. In one ditch, some Christians will say, any drinking is a sin. I had a lady like this in my last church. She thought any kind of drinking was sin, and her Jesus never drank alcohol. That's what she said. And then in the other ditch, there are Christians who say that you can drink as much alcohol as you want, under the banner of freedom and grace. And both of these ditches are wrong. We need to find the biblical middle. So let's just talk about that for a moment. Let's just first state this fact. Drinking alcohol, according to scripture, is not a sin. This coming from a guy who never drinks. All right? I haven't drank alcohol in almost 17 years, and I will say what the scripture says, that drinking alcohol is not a sin. Why do I say that? Let me give you a few reasons. Number one, Jesus made wine out of water. And had it served at a feast. And it wasn't watered down wine. It was the good stuff. (laughs) Two, Jesus also served wine at the Last Supper. The First Communion, they didn't use grape juice. They used wine. And three, Jesus drank wine himself. Presumably, he drank it at the wedding and at the First Communion. But we know explicitly he drank wine when he was on the cross. They served him on a stick, on a sponge. Wine and vinegar. And he drank it. So if it was a sin to drink alcohol, then Jesus sinned. Jesus will also drink wine with us again in the kingdom of God. He told his disciples that he will not share this drink and this food again until they're in their father's kingdom. Wine in scripture is presented as a blessing that gladdens the heart. It was used in the Old Testament to worship God in some certain circumstances. And it was also used for medicinal purposes. All this to say, if you want to be biblical about alcohol... You don't just want to be cultural or you want to, what you grew up with your family or, or your last church telling you. If you want to be biblical, you cannot say it is a sin to drink alcohol. Now, if you don't want to drink alcohol and you think that it's not a good idea or it's wrong for you, then you, you should not drink it. But you cannot impose your conscience on other people. The Bible is very clear about that. Now, for those of you who are drink, or comfortable drinking alcohol and you have a brother or sister who isn't, then you should do the gracious thing and not drink around them. That's pretty clear in scripture too. You should not use your freedom to expose their weaknesses. Instead, use your freedom to love your brother or sister in Christ whose conscience says that alcohol shouldn't be something we consume. Now, let's go to the other ditch. So the first ditch is saying that drinking alcohol is a sin. That's not right. The second ditch is saying we can drink as much alcohol as we want because of freedom and grace in Christ and we can get drunk because we're underneath the new covenant and God has forgiven us. That is wrong too. Drinking alcohol is not a sin, but getting drunk is a sin. In fact, I would argue of these two ditches, this is the more dangerous one. Because of scripture's repeated warning against drunkenness. Let me just give you a few. There are many. One, drunkenness ruins lives. Proverbs 23 says, Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, 
and slumber will clothe them with rags. In other words, your life will be destroyed if you're a drunk. Two, the Bible says that God's judgment is on those who get drunk. Isaiah 5, woe, which is a pronouncement of judgment. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may run after a strong drink, who tarry late into the evening as wine inflames them. People who get drunk can't serve in church leadership. Elders are to be sober-minded and not a drunkard. Deacons are not to be addicted to much wine. Drunks are also, in the Bible, often considered unbelievers. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, drinking parties. In other words, Peter says, unbelievers, Gentiles, they get drunk. That's what they do. They have drinking parties. And worst of all, drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if your normal pattern of life is to consistently get drunk... And I'm not saying getting drunk every single day, but like you're someone who regularly throughout the year, you get drunk, then you should be afraid. Because the Bible says this, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. It is, and it should not be said of Christians that we get drunk and that we have drinking parties. This is not my opinion. This is what scripture teaches. So Noah's sin is not drinking, it's drunkenness. And that brings us to our next point I want to show you, and that's Noah's shame. Verse 22, and Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. So before Noah gets up from this night of drinking wine, um, or rather, as he's getting ready to go to bed, he's intoxicated, and he takes off his clothes. Apparently he's hot or whatever's going on. He's in the privacy of his own tent. I guess he can do what he wants. But the Bible, especially the early chapters of Genesis, when it talks about nakedness, it's in reference to shame. That's what the scripture is teaching here, is that Noah shamed himself. Go back to Genesis 3, and you'll see that when Adam and Eve sinned, what was the first thing they did? They clothed themselves because they were naked and ashamed. Remember, God came to the man, and the man uh, said that they were afraid because he was naked. And the Lord said, who told you you were naked? And from that point on, nakedness was a shameful thing. And so what Noah's doing here is not only drunkenness, but he's shaming himself. And, and Ham, his son, knew that Noah was in a compromised position. And so he should have done what his brothers ended up doing. He should have covered his father, and he should have never said another word about it. But instead, he runs to tell his brothers to shame his father. That's the sin of Ham. The sin of Ham is he shamed his father. And, and though the text is, doesn't explicitly say this, I think it's fair to say that Ham's intentions were not good here. He's being divisive. He's bringing shame upon Noah. Maybe he didn't like his father's leadership any longer. Regardless, him telling his brothers about Noah's nakedness was Ham's sin He sowed dishonor and division in his family. And this just brings you to the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. Even though it's not given yet, God still expects these standards to be applied and upheld. Failure to honor your father and mother in the Old Testament warranted capital punishment. Children are given one primary command in the Bible, and that is to honor their parents. And so, It doesn't matter if you like your parents or how they treated you or even what your age is. The scripture's command to every person is honor thy father and mother. And so maybe your relationship to your parents has been strained. I have no idea. Maybe you need to reconcile with them and and treat them differently. Regardless of how they treat you, the Lord wants you to honor your parents. He promises blessings if you do and curses if you don't. Another sin that Ham commits is division. He is causing division in his family, and the Lord hates divisiveness. The Lord opposes divisive people. Proverbs 6.16 says there are six things that the Lord hates. 
seven that are abomination to him. And the seventh thing he listed, one who sows discord among brothers. The Lord hates division. The Lord hates the one who sows discord. Paul warned the churches repeatedly about divisive people. Just give you one text, Romans 12. I appeal to you, brothers, verse 17, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Paul told Titus, here's how you're supposed to govern the church. If you find someone who's divisive, warn them once and then twice and then have nothing more to do with them. He says they are warped and they are sinful and they are self-condemned. Divisive people tend to jump at the first opportunity they find to condemn the one that they're trying to point out. They want to expose error and sin, but love covers a multitude of sins. That's the contrast between Ham and his brothers. Look at verse 23. Then Shem, or Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both of their shoulders, walked backward, and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. This is what Ham should have done. Ham should have taken a garment, he should have set his eyes away from his father, and he should have covered his father's nakedness, and no one should have even known it happened. But instead, he exposed his father, and the first thing that his brothers do is they honor their father by putting a garment in between them, walking backwards, and letting it fall on their father without looking at his nakedness, lest they bring him shame. Ham acts like the serpent in the garden, exposing their father's nakedness. Shem and Japheth act like God and cover him up. Ham breaks the fifth commandment. His brothers exemplify it. That's because they love their father. And that's because love covers a multitude of sins. Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Can I just tell you that you're not going to like or approve of everybody you go to church with? Can I get an amen to that? What, you guys don't like each other that much? Gosh. <laughs> we should seek to show each other grace. We should seek to cover a multitude of sins with our, with our love for each other. And that's not to say we are to sinfully cover things up in a deceptive way. There's some kind of major offense then sure, that needs to be dealt with. But the Bible is telling us that in more times than not, we are to show each other grace, we are to show each other love, and we're to overlook our brother's offenses. In other words, you are to show people the same mercy you want them to show you. You are to treat people the way you want to be treated. At the very least, you need to avoid being like Ham, covering Noah's sins. All right, number four. Let's move on to Noah's prophecy. And this is where it really gets interesting. This is where we ask the question, and I don't know if this is, came up in your mind or not, but did you notice that Ham's the one who sinned? And who does he curse? Canaan. He curses Ham's son, not Ham himself. Verse 24, when Noah awoke from his wine and knew that his young, what his youngest son had done to him, he said, curse be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. So Noah blesses Shem, he blesses Japheth, but he curses, not Ham, but Canaan, Ham's fourth son. Ham has four sons, and the youngest son is Canaan, and that's the one Noah curses. So here's what happened. Noah wakes up from his drunken stupor and realizes he has clothes on he didn't go to bed with. And some of you are thinking, man, that's happened to me before. How did I get these clothes on? I have no idea. So naturally, he would have wondered, what happened last night? This is not my garment. So he would have went to his family and inquired about it, and that's when someone would have told him, probably his two sons, yeah, you were drunk last night, and you exposed yourself, and Ham went in and saw you, and Instead of covering you, he came to us and told us about it and shamed you. And so Noah responds to that by cursing Canaan and blessing the other two brothers. Now before we go on with this, again, this very well, this blessings and curses could have happened at the very end of Noah's life. 
So don't picture Noah coming out of his tent, still drunk from the night before, and just cursing his family, right? That, that's not necessarily what happened here. When the patriarchs, talking about Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, when they would pass down the patriarchal blessing to their son, they would often do it right before they died. This is how Abraham did it. This is how Jacob did it. They passed down, so Isaac did it. They passed it down right before they died. And it, it could be that because right after this, it says that Noah died. But it doesn't really matter in terms of time. What, what's really interesting here is the content of this prophecy or the content of these blessings and curses. Particularly, why does he curse Canaan and not Ham? Well, several reasons have been proposed. Let me just give you my take. Noah doesn't curse Ham because God has already blessed Ham. Look back at Genesis 9.1. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The blessing of God is already on Ham. So it could be that Noah can't curse the one God has blessed. Which, by the way, that's good news for you, Christians, because if you're in Christ, there's no condemnation for you. What God has done for you in Jesus cannot be reversed by any man or demon. Secondly, and here's really the point, Noah could very well be saying, instead of you know, a curse is going to be upon your family, that the sin of Ham is going to characterize Canaan and his line. And so what he could mean, and what I think is a good, a good chance that this is the right interpretation, is that this is generational sin. Meaning that the sin of Ham is going to then be passed down to Canaan and Canaan to his descendants and posterity. In Exodus 34, verse 7, it says, The iniquity of the fathers, the Lord will visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This is generational sin. And this is not to say that these future generations are paying for the sins of their father because we pay for our own sins. What it's saying is that when there's a father in the family and he has a sinful life, then his following generations can be characterized by that sin and that sin can go unbroken in that family lineage. And, and you know this all too well. We see families go through generations of unbroken sin. I see families all the time that are just plagued with addiction and you can trace it back to their father and their grandparents and their grandparents after them. Single mothers who go through boyfriend after boyfriend should not be shocked when their little girl grows up and can't maintain a relationship. Little boys grow up angry and mistreat women because that's all they ever saw dad do. So God is not necessarily punishing Canaan for Ham's sin. It's just establishing a sinful pattern in generations. Ham's sinful example was passed down to Canaan, but this still doesn't answer the question, why Canaan? I mean, why not Cush or, or Put or, or Egypt? Those are his other brothers. Why Canaan? And the answer lies in why Moses is recording this, uh, this passage. His first readers were the newly liberated Israelites. So Moses is, is writing this book after the Egyptian freedom after they're free from Egypt, and they're getting ready to enter into the promised land, and he wants the Israelites to know two things. Number one, why they're taking the land of Canaan, and why they have justification to slaughter the Canaanites. Because if they're getting ready to take this land, which they were afraid to do, they also would have had questions in their mind, like, why do we deserve this land? This land's not ours. And, and secondly, more importantly, what gives us the right to go into their land, to their property, to their homes, and literally kill every single person? Because that's what God's telling us to do. I mean, listen to this passage. Deuteronomy 20, verse 16. But in the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Remember he told Abraham, I'm giving you all these descendants and I'm giving you this land and it's the land of Canaan. He says, you shall save alive nothing that breathes, but you shall devote them to complete destruction, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as the Lord has commanded you, that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices that they have done for their gods, so that you do not sin against the Lord your God. In other words, you're to go in there and you are to annihilate every single man, woman, child, and beast. And they would have been well, what, 
why would we do that? And Moses is recording this text and saying, they've been cursed since the days of Noah. The Canaanites were wicked, wicked people. They practiced human sacrifice, even offering their babies to false gods. They were idolaters. They were sexually immoral. In fact, look over at chapter 10, verse 19. From the line of Canaan came Sodom and Gomorrah. The territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza in the direction of Sodom. The line of Canaan was wicked and God is giving theological and moral justification for their extinction. And what this goes to show you is that God is using his people as instruments of judgment because God has that right. God has the right to give life and God has the right to take life. And this is going to be a continued pattern in scripture because when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he's going to clear the land again. He's going to slaughter his enemies again and it's going to be in far worse fashion than when Joshua took the Israelites into the land of Canaan. He'll slaughter his enemies, and then he's going to usher his people into the promised land. So in many ways, this is a foreshadow of what Christ will do before he returns in judgment to establish his kingdom. So these are the sons of Noah. It's the prophecy of Noah. Finally, we get to the last part, and this will be really brief. Noah's death. It says, after the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Noah had a really good walk with the Lord, and he had this one unfortunate incident that we know about, but overall, he walked with the Lord and and demonstrated an exemplary life, and it just goes to show you that it's not about how things go throughout the middle of the course of your walk with Jesus. It's about really primarily how you end. That's the important thing. It's not about trying to be perfect It's about being faithful to follow the Lord and finishing well. I pray all the time, Lord, help me to keep my faith. Help me to not make a shipwreck of my family, my ministry, or my faith in you. Help me to finish well. And Noah finishes well, even though he had some stumbles along the way. And so there's so many things we could take away from this text. This is one of those passages where it's just, there's there's a plethora of things we could learn. But let me just give you a few things to walk away with. And I've already said this, but I'll say it again. Number one, God uses sinful people. And I mean that in the best way possible. God works through sinful people to accomplish his purposes. I mean, God used Noah to save the human race. And then look how he acts. Look how he behaves. He gets drunk and exposes himself. But despite all that, God was pleased to use Noah. He was pleased to not only redeem him, but to use him for his redemptive purposes. And so I just want you to ask yourself the question, is it possible that God could use you? Maybe you've thought to yourself, there's, there's no way God would want to use me in the ministry or to serve him. And that's just not true. There's nothing you've done in your life that is going to make you irredeemable or unusable for the Lord. You should be confident and encouraged. And so also, don't wait until you have everything figured out before you feel like you can go into God's service. When Jesus called the first disciples, what did he say to them? Come, I will make you fishers of men. I will make you into the men that I'm calling you to be. God first calls and then he equips. Number two, be a peacemaker and a unifier in the church. In other words, don't be like Ham. Be like Shem and Japheth. Ham exposed Noah's sins, his brothers covered it. A lot of people like to take shots when it's convenient. A lot of people love to expose others' errors for their own gain. But Christians, we should be peacemakers and grace givers. You have been reconciled to God by the blood of Jesus. God has made peace with you through the cross. You should be a peacemaker with other people. We should not be quarrelsome or divisive. We should be people that want to reconcile and be gentle, loving. We should want to unify and bring together, not to break apart. Number three, there's hope for wayward children. Ham dishonored his father and led to the downfall of his son's posterity. 
generational sin is real. And wayward children are real. I'm sure some of you in here have children that you've been praying for that would come back to the Lord. You'd pray that they would turn from whatever sin is keeping them in darkness and come back to Christ. It was the prayers of my mother and father that brought me back to the Lord. They, they never stopped praying for me. So don't discount what the Lord can do. As long as there's breath in your son's or daughter's lungs, there is hope for them. And so never stop praying for them because the gospel has the power to break generational sin. I come from a long line of people who struggled with addiction. And if I would have kept going in my direction and had a family, what do you think my kids would have been like? But the Lord broke that cycle. He broke that cycle through the power of the gospel and he can do the same for your family. Number four and finally, be prepared to meet God. Be prepared to meet the Lord. Noah lived 950 years, but then he died. He died, and unless the Lord returns, it's going to be said of you, and she died, or and he died. There'll be an obituary that states your name, died on this date. You have two appointments that the Lord has set for you. Two, the day of your death and the day of your judgment. Those are two dates that are inescapable, that are guaranteed, that there's nothing you can do in this life to change those dates. They have already been determined. The day and the hour you will pass and enter into the presence of the Lord is set in stone. I once worked with a man who said that he, he wanted to know before he would die. He wanted to have a little bit of control over it. He wanted to be able to have a say in when he would go. And what a fool. Because we don't know the day or the hour, but what we do know is the day and the hour is coming. That like Noah, we will die. And so you must be prepared to meet God. And the only way you and I can be prepared to meet God is by trusting in God's Son. Is by believing in Jesus Christ, the one who forgives sins, the one who redeems sinners, the one who shed his blood so that your sins can be washed away, the one who was raised from the dead so you can have victory over the grave the one who is judged so that when you stand before God, you don't have to be judged. God, guys, it's encouraging that the Lord uses broken people. It's encouraging that the Lord redeems sin and redeems sinners. And so I pray you take away from this text hope and encouragement that the Lord wants to use you in your life, that if he uses Noah, why, why couldn't he use you? That there's hope for children that, that walk away from the Lord. And most importantly, there's hope for every man and woman who's appointed a time to die and to be judged. There's hope in Christ. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you for that hope. And we, we want to pray now that anyone who has not prepared their life to meet you, that they would come to Christ now. And Lord, we, we pray that you would search our hearts. And if there be any unwillingness in our hearts or excuses why we don't want to enter into your service like we can't be used by you, then Help us to look to the story of Noah and be encouraged that God uses broken people all the time and always has. And Lord, for those who are praying even now for their wayward children, uh, may they come home and may we see many of your sons and daughters come home. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.